Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to our, our closing session of this wonderful conference. Um, I'm Sandra Fredman. I'm Professor of Law from Oxford University and Director of Oxford Human Rights Hub. We've been really delighted to have co-hosted this conference with Vidi and the Open Society Foundation. And thank you very much to everybody for coming. We are going to end actually with, with really a, a wonderful session. Um, the title of the session is The Role of Courts in Realising the Right to Education. We are really very honoured and privileged to have with us Justice A.P. Shah, um, who will start off the panel. I'm sure he's very well known to everybody here. He was the Chief Justice of the High Court of Delhi and the Madras High Court, and he also chaired the Law Commission of India, um, and the 20th Law Commission of India, the report of which has just come out. Um, He's going to start off the session and talk for about 15 or 20 minutes. After that, we are also very fortunate in having two um, of the foremost public interest litigators from South Africa, from the Legal Resources Centre, who have done a lot of work on right to education. You've already heard from both of them during the course of this conference, Michael Bishop here and Sarah Sefton at the end. Sarah apologizes that she has to leave a little bit early because she has to catch a plane back to South Africa. And, um, and we also, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Colin Gonzalez from the Human Rights Law Network who has also been at the forefront of public interest law litigation in India and he will also talk about his experience on, on the role of courts in realizing the right to education. So um, I'm very glad to begin this, this really wonderful session as our closing session of this conference. Can we, can we start then with Justice Shah? Oh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, invited by Pitti Center for Legal Policy to speak to all of you at the International Conference on Comparative Perspectives on the Right to Education for Minorities and Disadvantaged Groups. Uh, I am here to talk to you today on the role of courts in realizing the right to education. Uh, but before I start discussing the role of courts themselves, I thought it would be useful to understand a little bit about the constitutional, legislative and the even social history of, of India that led to the manner in which this right to education has evolved. There will be some repetition, I'm sure, because there, is a, there was a day-long uh, day debate on this right to education. But this, just to uh, uh, have, give a complete picture, I would refer to a few judgments as well. See, when the right to basic education was debated in the Constituent Assembly, our founding fathers believed that this right had a place in Part 3, along with other fundamental rights. However, some members of the Constituent Assembly thought that India would not have the necessary resources to provide for such a right. Therefore, they thought that the and some members uh, thus even suggested deletion of the right to education altogether. But eventually it found its place in chapter on non-justiciable directive principles, this idea which we took from the from Irish uh, constitution. So we have a article 45 which, which, which mandates that the government had to provide within 10 years free and compulsory education to uh, all children until they completed the age of 14. Therefore, the government had a duty to shift the right from part four to part three after 10 years. However, this took four decades when Article 21A was inserted in 2002 by way of 86 Constitutional Amendment. This shift of right to give birth, I mean this section 121C, which came as a, as a that's an important section to uh, in Right to Education Act, which cast a legal obligation on privately aided school to reserve 25% of seats in entry-level classes 
for children from economically weaker sections and disadvantaged categories. Reports suggest that if this law is properly implemented, it can impact a 1.6 crore children from economically weaker sections and disadvantaged categories in less than a decade. But the implementation of 121C faces serious challenges at all levels, administrative, legal, and financial. Let me come to the uh, journey of the right to education in our country. It's completely different from the what happened in other countries. For instance, in developed jurisdictions like US, Canada, Britain, Europe, this right was built upon the foundation of a fully funded government school system providing education of equal or near equal to all children. The issue played out very differently in Japan. I must give this example, uh, which is, which is rele relevant for our, our discussion today. See, as far back as 1872, Japan issued its fundamental code of education which said that there must be no community with an illiterate family, nor a family with an illiterate person. Kido Takayoshi, one of the leaders of Japanese reforms, this was during Meiji regime, he explained the basic idea that our people are no different from the Americans or Europeans of today. It is all matter of education. This was how this remarkable attempt at catching up with Western world began. By 1910, Japan was almost fully literate. By 1913, though much poorer than, than Britain and America, Japan was publishing more books than Britain and as many as twice as many as United States. So this concentration on education greatly determined the nature of the Japan's progress. Uh, in the in its economic as well as on other fronts. So what happened? China, Taiwan, South Korea, and other economies in East Asia followed similar routes and firmly focused on basic education. So surprisingly, I mean, it will be uh, I mean it, it will be very interesting to note at around the same time when Japan issued its fundamental code of education. In 1882, Mahatma Jyotiba Phule presented a memorandum to the Indian Education Commission, better known as Hunter Commission. In this memorandum, Phule pointed out how the British government's education funding benefited only the higher classes, like Brahmins of those days, and left the masses in ignorance and poverty. In 1911, Gopal Krishna Gokhale moved a bill on free and f compulsory education, but faced stiff opposition. And most of the princely states and feudal and, and their representatives, they said that there is no money for the for basic edu providing basic education. Then in 1937, uh, there was a conference of national education national education conference in Varda, and Mahatma Gandhi tried to persuade the newly elected governments to have this new uh, priority to basic education or he said it's nai talim and allocate adequate funds to the to this uh, basic education program uh, the all seven provincial governments they said that they will they had no money for this program and even the uh, founding fathers in constituent assembly debates i mean they they hesitated whether to uh, make it a fundamental right. If this bold move was taken at that time, I mean, I feel that the India could have changed its trajectory completely. So, and let's look at the newer constitutions like uh, South Africa or Kenya, which now provides the right to education as a constitutional right. So it was to come in 10 years as per Article 45. So it should have been late 60s or early 70s, this should have been introduced. But it, it was not done. In the meantime, an important development took place where we again missed an opportunity that was setting up of the first Education Commission of Independent India. That was in 1964-66, also known as Kothari Commission. Now, 
that recommended a common school system of education that would bring together different social classes and would promote equality and integration amongst people. Its suggestion was not to create mediocre schools or multi-layered schools and condemn disadvantaged citizens there. So what would happen is elitist, this is what is happening today, elitist, uh, the, the group, they would send their children to elitist schools and the whole goal of integration would be lost. So the Kothari Commission therefore recommended India needed excellent common schools where every child would grow voluntarily. I have studied in a in a uh, uh, in a uh, aided school in Sholapur, and believe me, I mean we we, we had all all uh, the poor classes from the from the minorities. It, it was a it was a it was a sort of a composite uh, 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 reflection of the of the different uh, uh, groups, and and really it 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 has. I mean I can proudly say that this. Uh, this uh, uh, this experience in my school in my co uh, school days, I mean that really uh, helped me to shape my views, my opinion. So uh, it you learn both ways. Uh, I mean a rich kid will learn that from the from the uh, his poor uh, classmates, and the poor classmates would also learn from their uh, I mean slightly better off. Uh, better of colleagues. So that was the idea of Kotari Commission. So this did happen and finally we have a, uh, uh, a right to education act. But before that the, the as a result of not f for accepting the recommendations of Kotari Commission this private school started flourishing and the private school flourished and our government schools have plunged into deeper problems. The standards in government schools have only gone from bad to worse. See the teacher absenteeism, lack of infrastructure, neglect of students. I mean, the uh, this uh, uh, inspection system has practically broken in almost all parts of the country. Uh, they, they government schools are today regarded as as uh, as educational ghettos where poor parents can leave their uh, their children while they go to work. Anyone, even with a basic basic uh, capacity, wants to put their children in private school and not in the government school. And on this background, then Unni Krishnan came and it says that the right to education flows directly from right to life. And the, judge, the judgment said that the Article 45 should be read in harmonious construction with Article 21. So this is how the really the first step was taken towards recognition of of the basic right to education. Now, Unni Krishnan went one step further. It said that the, the right to education exists up to the age of 14, but even beyond 14 there is a right to education. But that's, that is, that is, it is limited by the state's economic capacity and stage of development. So what the government claimed that it wanted to enforce Unni Krishnan judgment, so they, they they took steps, but there are, at the same time, they have looked at the ways to dilute the meaning of fundamental right to education. The first thing they did is to make it, uh, make it fundamental right only for the 6 to 14 age group. Now, thereby disentitling the crores of children below 6 years of age of their fundamental right to nutrition, health and pre-primary education. Now, there is a report of by the Law Commission of India, 259th report, where this is a report on the early childhood development and the report said that the development of young children is increasingly recognized as a development and human rights issue of critical national importance. Statistics on uh, malnutrition and neglect of young children in India today cannot be ignored and their significance for the nation's overall human resources cannot be overemphasized. However, the state's response is so far very slow. The commission recommended that Article 21A should be amended and the right to education should be recognized, that is uh, 0 to 14. I mean, that's what the Unni Krishna recognized. Uh, the first strategy, according to me, as a litigation strategy, should be to take this report to the 
to the Supreme Court and first saying the, the because Article 21A as it stands is inconsistent with the with the mm -hmm. pronouncement of Nunni Krishnan. So therefore, this should be the first priority the, with the, the NGOs and the those working in this sector should take up to uh, this alliance of early childhood development is working on this issue, but that may not be sufficient. Then the uh, secondly, what they what 21A says that education will be in provided in such manner as the state may by law determine. This is not the position of the other fundamental rights. It is very strange that it is restricted in this fashion. So the so and the then the RTE has come, and what the government has done by RTE that the entire burden of education is shifted to the private uh, private sector. The government has absolved itself of responsibility on the issue, and the RTE is silent on the health of the government schools. So the apparently government has no intention to improve the existing state schools or municipal schools. So there is a Allahabad judgment which I shall briefly refer to. But it is another important strategy is to make the government school accountable. There, there is a huge number of government schools and municipal schools. So if they are made accountable, they are improved. They, this will be uh, this will be added resource. Then the, the judgments in. The Society for Unaided Private Schools of Rajasthan versus Union of India, the first, the Supreme Court uh, exempted unaided minority institutions and and then the, uh, the Pramati education, this, they excluded both aided and unaided. I have a very strong opinion on this. I mean, I've seen minority institutions working. I belong to minority. My own community runs educational institutions. This has become a, 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 a this is, Completely commercialized. This is this is just uh, uh, in in so-called protection of the minority right. Uh, this was a contest between two important rights: 21A right to education and the uh, 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 minorities' right to institute uh, to establish and run uh, uh, educational institutions. But the uh, uh, this has really uh, this must be. The, the attempt should be made to get this judgment reviewed. I know it's a, uh, a almost impossible task, but look at what is the consequence of this. See, this is I think in the in this uh, uh, publication of Vidhi, this has been dealt with in detail. But I will refer to only two judgments. DAV College says that defines minority as any community which numerically less than 50 percent of the population, and TMA Pi says that holds language as a basis for establishment of different states for the purpose of Article 30. A linguistic minority will have to be determined in relation to the state population. Since in our country, states have been carved out on linguistic basis. So therefore, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's so happened that every religious and linguistic group is minority in some state or the other. That's a that's a tragedy. So as a result, these institutions are allowed to uh, 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 to run their schools without uh, 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 applicability of RTE. I, I feel that this position has to be changed. And there, the one judgment, I think, which uh, was uh, not considered by the Supreme Court, I mean, uh, that is Islamic Academy versus State of Karnataka, where the Supreme Court uh, uh, realize the need to strike a delicate balance. So the court held that since the admission of students relates to the economic and national interests of the nation, so therefore the latter should be allowed to prevail subject to protection of basic minority right. This is a very important uh, principle which which ought to have, ought to ought to have been followed in 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 the uh, uh, in the question of applicability of RTE to uh, to the minority schools. Then uh, the, the, there are other serious issues about implementation of RTE. What is the, who is eligible for that 25 percent uh, quota? So the, uh, I mean there are different states enacted different rules. So in Karnataka it is 3.5 lakhs, 1 lakh in some other states. So Bombay High Court said that the, this 1 lakh is, is too low. So it has to be on a, a higher basis. Then the, there is no grievance redressal mechanism under the RTE. 
there is on paper but it's very ineffective so uh, a grievance has to be made to state commission for protection of child rights or any alternate authority substituted under the under the state government by the state government now the uh, there is there is some authorities are constituted but the mostly this litigation goes to the high court and then the madras high court has held that the you cannot approach the high court directly unless you you uh, uh, i mean uh, invoke your alternative remedy you have to go to the authorities first and then you go to the high court and then there is no time limits prescribed for the either uh, uh, this scpcr or the other author authority to to decide the rights under the under the rte as a result i mean the rights are mostly defeated by the by the school administrations i have a suggestion which is which should be taken to parliament i mean i would like to read article 32 before you see this was a which which provision was never used and then this should be taken up in the context of uh, <coughs> right to education sorry see the article 30 32 to says the supreme court shall have power to issue directions or orders or writs including writs in the nature of habeas corpus pandemus prohibition quorantum and certiorari whichever may be appropriate for the government enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this act this is a very important provision which has not been used since independence since the uh, the since the uh, uh, commencement of the constitution that is Uh, clause three, without prejudice to the powers conferred on the Supreme Court by clauses one and two, Parliament may by law empower any other court to exercise within the local limits of its jurisdiction all or any of the powers exercisable by the Supreme Court under under clause two. So it is it, impossible. I mean, most of the families would find it. very difficult to approach the high court for the for redressal of their grievances so if a right to education once it is recognized as a as a fundamental right under article 21a as well as as the unni krishnan judgment then why this power should not be conferred on the uh, it the it says clause says uh, empower any other court to exercise uh, any of the powers exercisable i mean it can be limited to a subject i mean these these powers can be really conferred on the district court or whichever other mechanism the the government can conceive but the uh, by and large uh, is my experience that the that the there will is there is going to be very strong resistance by all elitist uh, schools from uh for taking students from this uh this uh, disadvantaged and the other categories or even disabled categories and then this for every stage there is going to be tussle i'm sorry to say this but the it's my ex also experience that the the authorities the courts mostly they are manned by 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 the people by the of the uh uh a middle class or a higher middle class or so i find that there is some reluctance on the part of the of the judiciary at least some of the judges to to accept this idea of some poor children being i mean being taught along with the along with this uh, uh, high uh, the children of this uh, i mean middle class or the higher middle class parents there is a tremendous i mean they say that this will destroy the uh, the education system this will uh, really bring the standards down which is which is as i said i mean uh, i'm talking about the uh, uh, some education system 50 years back and it was it was almost in terms of what kothari commission recommended and it worked very well so why it should not work now i mean so therefore Uh, so there would be many hurdles for implementation of the rte but i feel that the this there has to be uh, uh, i mean some uh, really uh, uh, the uh, a, a systematic effort 
to uh, to address these rights of the of the of the of the disadvantaged groups another thing which i realize is that the that pils uh, tend to be filed by individual lawyers uh, or parties mostly on ad hoc basis and in different courts in different maybe some are filed in the supreme court but there is no uh, st strategy for litigative strategy for filing such pils i feel that the vidhi and their partners should at least now the the first attempt to 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 uh, prepare a broad based policy what kind of uh, uh, i mean petitions would be filed in the in the high courts or the supreme court why there should not be an alliance of the ngos who are working in the field of enforcement of rte i think that there lies the answer and i hope that i mean there will be some steps taken in that behalf thank you thank you so much um so we are we are extremely privileged to have you share your thoughts and to have rounded up really what was a lot of the discussion that had been going on over the last two days um